everybody. Welcome to the Tone Dome. Uh, we are joined here today by David Taylor, bass trombone, virtuoso, and amazing musician and just an inspiration. He's also my chamber coach, so we've been talking and thought I would get him on the podcast. So thank you so much for coming, Mr. Taylor. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Sam. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. So every time we start <clears throat> with this podcast, uh, I have a mad lib. Go for and, it. And uh, we're, you're going to fill it out. I'm not. I'm going to fill it out. Yes. Oh, sir. you didn't tell me that part, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to say um I'm going to start by saying like or I'm going to give you what it is and you're just going to fill it out and I'll read it to you afterwards in a, in a the most interesting way I can possibly do so. So I need first an onomatopoeia, something that reminds you of the city, like a sound word that reminds you of the city. Car horn. Car horn. Well, and like a sound, you know, like a... Man! <laughs> okay, okay. I like it. All right, a verb ending in I-N-G. Boning. Boning. <laughs> An adjective. Great. <laughs> Great boning. Great boning. All right. A negative adjective this time. Not so hot. Not so hot. Well, can an adjective be three words? That's a little bit of a phrase. I'll put some uh, hyphens in between there. All right, right. No, no worries, no worries. A grand verb now, like something grand. I like it. The wheels are spinning. The wheels are turning. I can see it. <laughs> Supercalifragilisticexpialidociousing. <laughs> Oh my god, okay, okay. Supercalifragilistic expialidociousing. Fragilistic expialidociousing. Supercalifragilistic expialidociousing. I, I did not spell that right, but it's okay. Well, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll <laughs> hit you to it when you get there. Fraction, like a fraction, like one, one A sixteenth. One sixteenth? One sixteenth. Okay. Great. Your favorite alcoholic beverage? Wine. Wine. Any specific? Yeah. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc was sincere. Okay. All right. From either Alsace or uh, New Zealand. Okay. <clears throat> and then an involuntary action. Farting. Although some guys in our brass sections, that's a voluntary action. <laughs> there you go. A big number now. 1,897. Okay. I like it. It's a good year. 1897. 1897. 100 years August, before August I was born. What? Oh, August Rodin was... No, that's when he was working. Okay, okay. I was born 1997, so... God, I was born 194. I was born on D Day, June 6, 1944. Oh. That's that famous Normandy invasion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was born on that day. I've heard of it, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know where you cats are at anymore, what you know, what you don't know, because <laughs> I don't think I know what you guys know, you know. Well, I mean, how long did it take you to put that picture of me together? The picture? Uh, 15 minutes, maybe, something like that. That would have taken me all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'd actually like to use that if you take yeah. out the name and the words if you wouldn't mind yes. man i like the background it's kind of, of cool course. And... i'll do it any any kind of background you want you just yeah no that's it along. cool just take out the words man right. yeah. sounds good all right and and the last one your favorite belonging my shoes <laughs> <laughs> Any specific shoes? Just shoes? Yeah, I just got a pair of Asics, man. That uh, knocking me out. Okay. All right. All right. I mean, I'm gonna. That's, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm gonna uh, read this out now. Am I gonna right. lose my jobs now, man? <laughs> no. No, you're not. You're not. All right. All right. So, so I took some inspiration from. We've been talking about literature and all the sorts of stuff that you're into, and um, I created this story that kind of meld some things together, but really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So here we go. Okay. It's called don't stay in 
in school, cats. All right, that's the title. Map. Silence is foreign in this part of town, says Bix. The cars rushing past, the wind boning your ears, the countless conversations growing close enough to hear the breath between phrases and then receding from the foreground into the ceaseless hum of the city. It's enough to drive anyone mad. Mad? Asks Glenn. That hum is the great canvas that everyone here paints their lives on, he says. Bix gazes out over the busy street from his music studio window, contemplating his friend's not-so-hot rebuttal. Glenn starts up again. The truth is, these streets can inspire, can depress, can motivate, and can supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> but through our art, we can sift through the noise to find the real truth of the moment. Bix turned away from the window that was stuck one sixteenth of the way open to face Glenn, as if that would help him understand. The truth of the moment, Bix asked. Have you been drinking too much Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand? Again, Glenn? Without making eye contact or farting, Glenn says, Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Each moment can be remembered through art, but what the art represents was 1,897 times sweeter. You gotta live in the moment, Bix. With that, Glenn gathered his ASIC shoes and ran suddenly out of Bix's studio. Bix was dumbfounded, but as the noise of the city replaced the confusion in his ears, it became suddenly clear. All we have is right now. Right now is the truth. And the truth is beautiful. Dude. There we go. I love it. You wrote that? <laughs> I did. Yeah. You want to keep writing, man. Um, yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it too. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, let's start with that then. Like, I, I love what you say about the beauty is truth revealing itself. I, you've said that in a couple classes now, and I, I just want to know what, what that means to you. You know, that's yeah, well, quote, uh, truth revealing itself. Yeah. Truth revealing itself. Yeah. Yeah, what is that? Uh, that's, a, that's a statement of, uh, that's from Auguste Rodin, but it could have even have been before that, Yeats. But Auguste Rodin made it his own. He said, there's no such thing as beautiful color. There's no such thing as beautiful line. There's no such thing as beautiful form. There's only one beauty, and that's the beauty of truth revealing itself. Right. No, no beautiful tone, no beautiful intonation, no beautiful uh, scales, just truth revealing itself. So what, what do we listen for then what what does that what does that translate to in music you know in music yeah be in the moment be in the, be mo in the moment Just, right uh, and how do you prepare to be in the moment i well i'm a big fundamentals practicer i mean i i practice scales when i'm not practicing music or improvising i'm practicing my scales very slowly so that um, i can concentrate uh, on uh the sound before it the sound immediately after leaving the mouthpiece, not when it comes out of the horn. So right. I'm concentrating on diaphragm support and articulation. Intonation comes along with that. But you know, it's funny when you have a great sound and it's uh, well balanced, highs and lows, intonation and sound are indiscernible almost. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's I think. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I think a similar way. I mean, I just, I just, you do a lot of research, like you talk about doing a lot of research and, and certain things like that. And can you talk a little bit about the kind of research that you do and how that helps maybe inform your musical decisions or like, or do you well, think I'll, I'll in a narrative a way or, you know, go well, ahead. No, I mean, it depends on the needs, you know, um, I, I never, I never wanted to play the conservatory solo repertoire. Yeah. So I had to find alternatives for that. And I never really wanted to play conservatory kind of concerts. I always wanted to play in front of the public. And I got that way because when I went to Juilliard, I couldn't get into any chamber music classes or uh, theory classes even. I was not, a, I couldn't read really. I mean, umpa tube, I could read, and, but I didn't know theory. So I, I immediately went out 
to the street and the community orchestras and anything that came my way. So I wanted to continue that, you know, because yeah. I talk about truth, man. When you're playing in front of people who aren't musicians in New yeah. York, you get to know the truth right, right away. So, I mean, I, I was researching all kinds of composers, and, uh, you know, the, the composers that I, I learned about in school that I thought would uh, be interesting for me. Uh, and uh, then I had to justify my interpretations. And that that was another aspect of research. I might have given you, uh, you know, it's funny, man, I'm teaching so much over the last 25 years. I don't know who I'm telling what to anymore. <laughs> but uh, but I'll repeat it. I mean, yeah, um, I, I played a concert. Oh, I know where it was. I, I was mentioning it to that low brass class that you attended last yes. week in mm -hmm. Manhattan School. I was hired to to make an orchestra arrangement of a piece for arpeggiona and piano. The arpeggiona was an instrument, oh, around 1818 to 1830. It was kind of a big viola re guitar -y kind of a thing. Yeah, right. And um, I couldn't play part of it. it. The technique was just beyond me. You know, it's violin stuff. Right. So I changed the technique to suit my needs. But in order to be convincing about it, I had to figure out why was I able to come to the conclusion. Uh, I came I, I came to the interpretation before the conclusion. That's oftentimes. I mean, like when I when I compose, I don't know what the piece is about until I'm into it. Right. Yeah. You know, so, or nor the title, or whatever. I mean, I don't set out to prove a point or anything. You know, so. Uh, but but uh, I do the research so that in my mind, I, I can justify my honesty and uh, spread my lies with impunity. <laughs> spread your lies with impunity. Right. Plus, you, I mean, you mentioned composition. I, so trans, transitioning into being a composer for yourself, you know, um, right. what kind of stuff do you take from other composers i mean are you trying to be blank slate about it tabula no, rasa no i mean no no you know it's like a, one of the first pieces i wrote was a five mo uh, movement suite i called two suite and i've recorded in several combinations i recorded it with 21 trombones the Washington trombone ensemble i recorded it yeah. with piano i made a duo out of it um one movement of the five. Uh, uh, I love Franz Schubert, so there was a, a piece called uh, Die Nebensonnen, the Mock Sons, the Three Sons. It's about a fellow uh, wandering in the sunlight, wandering. Uh, some mm. people think um, that there is a manifestation of three suns. It's kind of a prismatic kind of a thing, or yeah. perhaps he was contemplating suicide. So I wrote the five mo uh, movement piece based on a bipolar, uh, 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 my thoughts about bipolarity. Hmm. You know, so I, I use the the song. I I use the um, Wilhelm Müller's the, the, uh, the 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 text of the poem to name each one of my movements, and I even quoted the song. I sang the song in one of the five movements. Right, you know? yeah. and I do that in front of orchestras. Incidentally, I sing now in uh, my own <laughs> non uh, classic way. You know, yeah, uh, more based on what I've heard from jazz musicians. And so that, that piece actually started out um, after I was studying uh, Charles Ives' Concord Piano Sonata, Sonata number two for about two years, three years. And so I, I got inspiration from that. Hmm. Uh, and then I got inspiration from Schubert. Uh, one of the movements was inspiration from some Renaissance music. I, I never quote the music. Right. I, I just take it and then start improvising over it sometimes you know and uh use it for the basis of that oh so it's um, so it's kind of like sometimes you do like a stream of consciousness kind of improv and then it the way it comes out you'll write it down I'll, that... I'll i'll start to solidify yeah i mean like there was one time man i just wrote down a series of numbers i was watching i was laying around in bed watching something and I laid down a whole series of just numbers. Yeah. And, and then I put bar lines and it worked out to be a blues. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And then I used the numbers. Yeah. For the note things. It kind of worked out. You know, that actually became one of the movements of those five movements. But then again, I mean, I just, I'm having a CD coming out now that I called the Windswept Voices. Hmm. And, and I wrote a piece called Ode to Anton. Somebody asked me to write a three minute unaccompanied piece based on the music of Anton Dvorak. So I researched his humoresques. I don't know if you know anything about that, yeah. but mm -hmm. these are short pieces. And, 
and he was inspired by uh, indigenous our indigenous people right native americans uh afro-americans and um it was really a testimony to where our music could go yeah right i liked it so much so that i've after performing it i i I opened it up into an eight minute piece with piano. And then I put a second movement to it, kind of like a divertimento. And I, I wrote it, I just wrote a divertimento. And then the third movement I wrote, I dedicated to Totanka Leotanka, that sitting bull, who was a man of uh, great warrior, entertainer actually, with the uh, Buffalo Bills Wild West show all around the world, and then a peace advocate. And was horribly accidentally murdered, but uh, so you know, so uh, usually a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff always comes back to some kind of political thing. But I don't like to talk about it because I want people to know about the music, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you want to delve into the politics of it, fine, you know, go ahead. Sure. It's usually humanitarian kind of. A, so when when you have when you have a certain idea like that, like um, like you're saying you're talking about a certain person or something, and when it comes to actually executing the piece um and playing it in front of people are you in a mode where you're thinking about the person while you're playing or is is that in the practice room like i'm i'm making decisions no you know and like i said i mean um I, I wasn't thinking about a specific when i started writing it it just all makes sense within within the concept of the piece it's a 20 minute piece 25 minute piece what i do uh, try to make sure is it, if uh, I'm writing uh, works that uh, I call them concertini or uh, concerti, mm -hmm. I make sure they're at least 20 minutes long. Okay. And yeah. that's business because if you're going to play in front, and I have done that, if you're going to play in front of an orchestra, man, you can't be playing eight minute trombone pieces. <laughs> the orchestra yeah, needs right. a solid piece of music so they can put an overture in front of it or something. And uh, so I, I do, that's really more a matter of pre-thought through sure yeah uh, you know so i i i mean i've watched a lot of your videos over the past few days i would say and i mean also in the past as well i i, I attended the temple trombone workshop or the summer trombone workshop wow I man when a long time ago yeah it was god uh, why didn't you tell me that before <laughs> i left it for the podcast to surprise oh you. <laughs> man isn't that wonderful it was, it was nitsan and uh, yep. Haim and myself oh yep. man That's right yeah, it was Rio Hidash. Yes. Oh my God. Yes, I remember. Yeah, Nitsan was floating up. We there. we we did a recording. We never put it out. But Nitsan called me up uh, about a month ago. He now he's now that he's getting older, he wants to put stuff out. So he <laughs> so he's reinitiating the editing and uh, yeah, uh, right. this, uh, CD. But yeah. I, I've I've always been inspired by the way you talk about and think about things. Like it seems, it seems to me like a lot of people don't get it though you know what get i mean what? Like, get, they, there's there's something um you take a lot of risks in your performances and i think that it's it, w it was always inspiring to me but i think some people maybe didn't understand that can you talk you know, about a lot of people i mean I, I that's very astute i mean it's funny i'm not going to mention his name but yesterday i, I got a, a text it was very disarm it was very upsetting to me actually um from a from a young a next young student of mine from MSM who was really very upset about this situation we're going through now. Yeah. And little by little, we started going back and forth. And he said, you know, it's funny, man. I wish I had done certain things differently. He said, when I would tell people that I was studying with you in the school, mm -hmm. when I was telling people I was studying with you, they kind of laughed. No. Oh, you know, yeah. Like, why would you study with him? You know, that kind right. of thing. So I, I've been up against that since I'm 24. Since I, uh, since I really made a, I, I started playing, Oh, you want to hear about that? Uh, and then yes. remind me of what the question was. You know, I mean, um, just just about taking risks. I mean, I think I think that it's it's part and parcel, but with well, what the we're risk for about. me was auditioning for music school. Mm, okay. I, yeah. I mean, I, I I was the first one in my family. My parents, nor my older brother, graduated from high school, and so I was the first one to graduate from high school. We were kind wow. of a working class family in Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, the luck that I had was that I attended school the day that Mr. George Sasso came to my elementary school and gave us a music aptitude. To, it's really, I, I think everything is luck. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was that kind of, or doors open that I made sure I went through. And uh, so when I went to junior high, 
seventh grade. Uh, we all started on trumpet, and I was pretty good the first month. He needed a tuba for his uh, senior band and orchestra. Okay. I couldn't read yeah. or anything. I didn't even know how to blow. Yeah, I just played trumpet for a month. And I was the shortest kid in the class. And he comes out with this tuba. And he says, who thinks they're big enough to play this bright, shiny tuba? And that, he knew it was going to be me jumping up, you know, because <laughs> I was a runt in the class. Yeah. And I lucked out. He put me in the senior groups and I was playing tuba and all of that stuff. But I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, at one of the classes that Manhattan gave, Joe, Joe Alessi and I were, were there. Joe came on after me. They asked me what were the three choices of what I wanted to do with my life if I didn't play the trombone. Yeah. And I said, well, an engineer, a truck driver, because I, I really wanted to be a truck driver, sure. or a circus clown. You know, the circus clowns, um, and some <laughs> of the guys didn't understand what a circus clown was. Yeah. Circus clowns, man, were the guys who saved bull riders from getting yep. bored. Mm -hmm. These were the guys that would dress up Burr. like hayseeds, right? Yeah. Yep. And they would jump out of barrels, <laughs> and they would, they would do crazy stuff just to get the bull's attention. Now, of course, the circus clowns, they wear helmets and yep. mm -hmm. all that. Modern, all that safety precaution. All this, all the, all the, the <laughs> overrated, you know. Yep. So uh, the funny thing was, so the cats laughed their ass off. And then when Joe, when they asked Joe, he's he didn't know what I had. Oh, Joe. So Joe said, well, either an engineer or a truck driver, and I forget what his third thing was. He says, but I tell you the truth, man, I'd like to hear what Dave Taylor said. <laughs> and it just so happened that the two of us agreed on, wow. on two out of three of the choices. So when I went to music school, man, I mean, I auditioned on the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, second movement, mm -hmm. um, slow movement. Wow. That's different. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's what helped solidify my acceptance sure. in the school. I didn't get a scholarship or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they, they heard this guy playing the slow movement to the Haydn trumpet concert. Oh, what the hell is this? Uh, they, <laughs> uh, they gave me the orchestra reading test. I kind of probably failed that. I know I failed the theory test, but I got in to yep. Manhattan and to Juilliard. I went to Juilliard because I wanted to study with David Schumann. I really had no idea. I mean, we did have a record player in my house last 15, 16. Right. So we had you, no you background in music. Tuba? You were still playing tuba or trombone uh, at this point. Um, I had given up the tuba. My okay. my young... Oh, I, right. I'm sorry. I skipped over. No, no uh, worries. No worries. When I was 17, <laughs> uh, my younger brother played the trombone. Okay. He graduated from high school, too. And then he went became a, a, a chemical engineer. Oh, wow. At Edward. And, and so I, I took Edward's... Uh, my younger brother, man. Um, we're very tight. Uh, and and one of the reasons is because we love our father so much because dad had three jobs. He, he kept three jobs going to wow. keep oh, the, oh yeah, man. I mean, hard working man. It, it was hard work. Uh, we didn't have any money, kind of, you know. We didn't think we were poor, but we we had nothing. And uh, so I didn't even know. I mean, I I, I was a good player for junior high so, and high school. So I figured, yeah. all right, what the hell, you know? So I, I got into Juilliard, uh, I'm not knowing what's what. And about my third year in, uh, somebody put a bass trombone in my hand. Oh. Because I had a gig. Yeah. Uh, they said, you know, uh, there's a Lita Krantz that was a social orchestra looking for a third trombone player, but you have to have a bass trombone. So I borrowed one from Juilliard. It was a con 72 H. <laughs> so that was a stroke of luck. Yeah. And then when I started playing it, because I kind of dug it, I guess it related to the tuba. Sure, yeah. Um, the guys from the best brass trombone player, a guy named Phil Jamison and Bob Mo uh, Mo uh, Moses, clarinet player, mm -hmm. uh, Alfred Wallenstein, a very good conductor, came by and uh, the orchestra I was playing in did uh, Don Giovanni. Yeah. And uh, we were in the pit in what was then Borden Auditorium. I don't know what they call it now. It's a big hall that was just redone on the main floor. There was an orchestra pit there. These yeah. guys come back and they said, hey, Dave, do you realize what you're doing is different? It's really fantastic. And I said, no, I had no clue, you know? Hmm. Uh, uh, but within six months, I was playing, while I was in school, in Leopold Sikovsky's orchestra in uh, Carnegie Hall as a regular. Uh, I was doing Broadway show subs and stuff like that. We weren't supposed to be doing Broadway. So all this was luck. Yeah. And and um, 
What, what, do you think it's luck or is it like right place, right time? I guess that's yes, the same thing. Yes, right but... place, right time for okay. sure. And yeah. going through doors, no restrictions. Like right. people say, well, don't do shows at that time. I didn't think about that, man. I, I just want to hone my craft and make some dough. I never had money. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. it's true, man. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Um, what was really interesting to me is as soon as I started doing my first jobs, man, when I was like, 21 2021 20, i was making more money than my dad he dug it yeah he dug it i bought me a volkswagen beetle in 1967 royal blue heating off the manifold <laughs> i'll never forget man oh that um, sounds awesome yeah we, it was man we did a concert of, uh, with the mirac of the miraculous mandarin i'll never yeah. forget this man and it starts off at the moment you know bop 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 there's a big bass thing, trombone solo in the beginning right? yeah, 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 and, yeah and that thing went over i mean people were kind of digging it and i'll never forget being elated driving that volkswagen beetle down the west side <laughs> highway back to back to brooklyn yeah. man. uh but, but anyway, so it was all being in the right place at the right time, and I never turned anything down, and just and so I was networking even when I didn't realize I was networking. Right. Um, I didn't have a background like some guys, like probably you and a bunch of other guys, man, I, whom I envy. Um, they're playing the trombone since they're 10, 12, mm -hmm. 7, you know, and their yeah. parents were musicians, their parents were professors, their parents were. So I, I, I never had that kind of thing. So I came into this whole thing kind of different, you know. And uh, I was married while I was at Juilliard. Wow, yeah. And then we had our first child six months out of Juilliard. Uh, oh, my God. I had God. no career. So I was just trying to make money, man. You know, Yeah, that'll whip you into shape right there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, kids don't want to hear about your aesthetic. They want to hear about where's my Cheerios, you know, yep. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's up in the back there. I don't know if you can see it over this shoulder. Yes. That's that's my son and I hanging when he was one. Oh, man. Uh, one year old. Man, I, I was smoking a cigar and I had a beard. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, so everything was... Um, to learn my craft and it's still that way yeah uh, um i'm still trying to learn my craft and uh what was the question now well i <laughs> well i don't even remember at this composition point, I, I remember i think composition it, I think it was about in. risk taking uh, oh in, in performance i i mean i i just i know no other way that's great I yeah i think that's it's, awesome. you know when you fail and i do often yes it's hard. It's still hard, man. You know? Yeah. It's, oh, man. I mean, do, do, when you fail, like, do you, do other people feel the same way that it was a failure? Because I think, I think, yeah. I think I fail often as well, but some people are like, oh, it's great. You know, is that, is that kind of the, the musician mindset? You know, I, I could always do better. And well, I know I didn't have to give a recital at, at, at Juilliard. David Schumann, my beloved teacher, passed away when I was in my third year or so. Mm -hmm. And they brought in Keith Brown and Alan Ostrander to teach me and, and all of that. And uh, so somehow I kind of wove my way through without giving a recital. But when I was, wow. I was playing, yeah, <laughs> but, I, but I always liked the, the modern, the contemporary music scene. So I, I would play individual pieces on a performance I would commission. Mm -hmm. trying to learn you know so you try to go to the best compositional minds you can yes and composers that had places to play venues right you know, like i never really commissioned a piece that 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 the mofo didn't have a venue you know what i mean right. yeah 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 uh, mm -hmm. so i did that and then when i was 40 i said no it's time to do a recital mm -hmm. so i rented carnegie recital hall and i played this recital and the place was packed with all the professional musicians because yeah. you know, i was 40 already and i was kind of well known in the studio scene the freelance orchestra scene you know and, and uh and the jazz big man scene so they all came and, and i played this recital where that was horrendous man it was like everything i threw in the everything man the kitchen sink no rest <laughs> i was running off the stage for water i didn't even know you had it you could bring water on the stage or yeah. i mean i was just green yeah. um I told my son, that boy up there, he was 10 years old at the time. Now, look, Scott, you're one of the few men I trust. So I want you to come back and tell me how I did. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. Okay. So I've been running off and on the stage, getting water, and, you know, I'm just acting like a wild man. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the concert, man, the audience got up in a whoosh. 
Yeah. He gave me like a standing ovation. I, I thought they were putting me on, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and and then back in the green room, man, my little, my boy was pushing through Alan Dean and all the cats. And he said, pop, pop, terrible. You know, that kind of a thing. Uh, but I, I, so, I mean, to me, that was really, and I had rented the Parker Meridian Hotel, which was around the corner of 57th Street. I rented a suite through a party. Yep. And then when everybody left, I just trashed the joint. You know, yeah. I, I just was beside me. And that happened to me more than one time. I mean, uh, it happens. And so people just overlooked it, I guess. You know, it's kind of like a Babe Ruthie thing. You know what I mean? It's like the cat struck out more than anybody. But yep. you hit a lot of home runs, man. You know, right. so, so I guess that's what happened. You can't look at the individual... Yeah, failures. You, you, everybody knew I was a practicer because mm -hmm. I was practicing incessantly, man, on jobs anywhere, man. I just practice. I, I wasn't, I didn't socialize. Yeah, practicing all the time. Played a gig on a break, off into the corner, practice. I mean, that's where I was. Really? So people wow. had faith in the fact that whenever I did fail, I was serious as a heart attack. You know, I right. I was trying to get that thing done, and I think that's a big, a big factor. You know, we the big factor. Also, I was probably entertaining. Yeah. Well, that's you that's know? the one thing that I love about watching you play. It is entertaining, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, man. No, man. It's, it's like entertaining. We, we're entertainers. You yeah. know, George Bernard Shaw, the great um, English writer from the nineteenth yeah. century, man. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a, he was a music critic. He was everything else. He said that artists are the upper echelon of the servant class. <laughs> Interesting. We are yeah, the yeah, upper yeah. echelon of the servants class, man. Uh, you know, so uh, hmm. I never pandered to an audience, right? But I know, I know what an audience needs. After all, we're, we're representatives of uh, right. Yeah, so of our generation, you know. That's something else I wanted to ask too. I mean, you're you're selling yourself. I mean, what you're saying, you're like the put the Cheerios on the table, right? I mean, right. You got to sell yourself to an audience. So has that impact that hasn't impacted your artistry at all well you have to remember man i really was kind of slick yeah. uh, i i had i i was man i was playing with the philharmonic mm -hmm. st luke's orpheus while i was playing with thad jones wow. gil evans while i was doing billy joel records and stuff like you know <laughs> what i'm saying man so i had wow yeah. my freelance career wasn't like when you say freelance i mean i was under pressure all the time yeah, on, on prime gigs. So what that meant, though, was I didn't have to worry about my solo career earning me any money. Mm. Right. So that gave me freedom. Yes. Uh, the fact that I was earning my living, supporting my family, and incidentally, when you think of my your most pride profession uh, possessions that you were, I didn't want to put it in those terms, mm -hmm. but one of the biggest successes of my career is I kept my family intact. Yes. Wow, yeah, that's super important. And you cats ought to be thinking about that stuff. It's not about the filled up date books. It's about right. what goes on while those date books are getting filled up. Right, yes. You know, I made a joke in your brass quintet uh, that we were talking about this, and I said I ought to give a spouse picking class. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> Can we do that right now? Yeah, what, all what's right. your yeah, advice? That. What's your <laughs> advice for spouse picking? I'm, I'm well, curious. I tell you, man, the first day, the first <laughs> like dunk your head under the water and <laughs> bob for apples, you know. <laughs> no, I mean it was really wild, man. The first date that I took Rania, my wife, on, um, I was playing the Stravinsky Octet at Brooklyn College. Okay, yeah. And I said, "Come on, you know." And I remember how she was dressed, and she was so beautiful, man, and uh, still mm. is, man. She takes care of herself. Uh, that's big for me. That's one of the. That's I hate to say it, man, but. Uh, don't sell sex short. At any rate, I took her. <laughs> I took her to. Um, I took her to this Stravinsky Octet concert, and she dug it. Yeah. And she was like the first woman. I mean, back my generation, not like your generation. I mean, most of us didn't know how to be pals or friends with with ladies. You know. Mm. You think my generation is better at that? Well, my wife says. Okay. Wow. I don't know. I, I think you guys are just the same as we guys were, but 
there's so many more rules now. God, yeah, damn. that's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, well, we're, they make us very aware of the rules. I think from the yeah, beginning. Well, you're woke, you know. Woke culture. Yeah, yes. you cats are woke. <laughs> but, but at any rate, so, um, and she saw me. We just had a great time together, and um, she went to my concerts. Still does. Uh, when I lost all my jobs three mm-hmm. years after we were married, she went back to work and said, you stay home and practice. I don't want you kissing any contractor's ass. Wow. That's how you pick a spouse. Yeah. Brother. Wow. Oh my God. And, and then my career kind of took off again. And, uh, you know, although I had setbacks, I've had two or three big dips because of the risk taking, mm-hmm. you know, but I always recovered. Yeah. Let's, know. let's talk about that a little bit. I think, sure. cause, cause I think, like looking at your career, I mean, you just named a bunch of people and it seems like a lot of fun to me, you know? Oh, I love, I, I mean, I haven't worked a day since I started playing the trombone. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's my goal. You know, I just want to yeah, I've been play, very play trombone man. for people and that's, yeah. that's it, you know, but yeah, I, I'm just wondering when, when it wasn't so fun, you know, like when you didn't have something going on. Well, I was used to coming out. I think the worst thing yeah. that, musicians or artists can enter their careers with is expectations. Right. I had no expectations. You were living in the moment, right? I mean, mean, be an artiste. Great. You know, what the hell is an artiste? I didn't even know what an artiste was, man. You know, (laughs) Um, I I knew I liked the upper echelon of the servant class, right? That's what we are. man. (laughs) So, So, I mean, I knew I liked uh, contemporary music. Um, I didn't want to be a library mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, incidentally, after COVID, I think we're going to find out how many opera houses survive and how many orchestras survive. That, yes. That's going to be a very wild. You got your age group is in great, great shape, I think, man, because I think the playing field is going to be a little more level. Yeah. Post COVID. Yeah, I think. I, why? Why do you think that is? I mean, the... because nobody knows what the hell is going to go on. Right. Yeah. That's um, true. Funding is gone. Uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. So if you're smart, mm-hmm. you get your head out of the sand and you figure how you can concentrate on what you really want to do while not shunning alternatives. Sure. Yeah. I never thought of that before. Shunning alternatives. Don't, Don't shun, shun the alternatives, man. Keep your mind open. Yeah. Um, like I said, oh. people didn't think I should go to Broadway, play in Broadway theaters. Oh, wow. But I did back in the yeah. day. I did. And because of that, I got to play with Duke Ellington, the real Duke Ellington, not the subsequent Duke Ellingtons. You know what I mean? Wow, yeah, yeah, Because yeah. somebody was sitting next to me, a guy named Julian Priester, who played with Coltrane, played with Ellington, recommended wow. me. So you never know where the... Um... And I was going to stop playing recitals after that horrid, horrid night that I had. But I had already booked Merkin Concert Hall for the spring. Yeah. So I said to hell with it. I'm going to go through with this. I, I'm, I, I already laid my money down for that hall. I'm going to go through with it. I modified some of what I did. And uh, New York Times was there, and they gave me a lovely review. Wow. Now, yeah. reviews don't mean anything, but it helps you get gigs. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I've been very lucky in New York. You know, I've been playing solo stuff in New York for almost 50 years, man. Right. I mean, not not the David. I'm talking about playing some <laughs> yeah. wild stuff. Yes, and, yes. And then my own composition. And so the newspaper, I've been reviewed over the 50 years. I mean, I, I'm going to have to research that in the New York Times and all these places. Wow. I was I mean, a member of the St. Luke's Chamber Orchestra. You know about yeah. Risk? Yeah. When, when it first started, I was, I was a member of that orchestra. And they, and, uh, they were playing a concert in Tully Hall. I went up to the manager, a fellow named Alan Hovannis wrote me a concerto for string orchestra and myself. Um, This is kind of, I was always very aggressive, I think, in trying to expand my craft and my career. Um, I went up to the manager of the orchestra and said, look, I know you don't want, you don't need a bass trombone as your soloist, at Tully Hall when you first go in there, but I can get you a critic. Mm-hmm. And I did. Critics showed up because Hamanas was a big name at the time. 
Yeah. The Times was there. The Jersey papers were there. I mean, the Times, I mean, they all gave me good reviews. New York Times said, uh, Mr. Taylor plays superbly, but watching him can make you seasick. Because <laughs> <laughs> I move around. I yeah. tried. So for, for then on, for the next year or so, man, whenever I played a solo, I sat down because I wanted to try to cure oh, that oh. one. But they got you so conscious about it. Wasn't any fun, right? I got so <laughs> it wasn't any fun. So I just got up and I just did yes. what I do, you know, that kind of thing. So I guess that's all. You know, everything I just told you is a risk, man. I mean, um, right. You know that great pianist, um, now deceased, of course, from the old days, Arthur Schnabel. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the cats that really brought Schubert out of the 19th century and 18th century into the 20th century. Yes. His motto was safety last. You know, safety people talk last. about safety first. You, yep. you know, watch it. His motto is in performance, safety last. Mm. And I'm a believer in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like Maurice Ravel says, you know, everybody talks about form and structure. The object of form is to keep the audience interested. That's good form. That's Maurice Ravel, man. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's you know, so, and, yeah. And, and that's a thing too in, in performance. I mean, um, I don't have the ability to play the same way twice. Right. I, mean, I kind of wish I did because it gets hard on recording sessions. Right. Because yeah, you have to wade through <laughs> all the takes. Yes. Man. But like, um, you're not a computer though. I mean, no, I don't have yeah. the, I don't, I don't have that ability, mm -hmm. but, uh, but got composers need their piece sold to the audience. Right. Um, one of the keys is keeping the audience on the edge. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be predictable. Mm, okay. You want to be predictable in the overall confidence of the thread of the piece. Right. The audience needs to be confident in your... They need to be confident in the thread and yes. what you're doing. Now, whether mm -hmm. that's sound or... Uh, Just deportment. Technique. Yeah, I mean, or... I even get to the point where I'm playing... If I'm playing a, a, a wacky kind of concert, I'll put a suit on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just to give it dignity. Oh, like okay, I see what you're you saying. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm playing a concert, the uh, the uh, maybe uh, that's really kind of tight. I mean, I'll come out in some kind of beautiful shirt, something like that. You know. So I mean, I modify all of that stuff. Man. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, uh, you know, so, so I present myself and do my thing, and um, more often than not, it's worked. Do you find that you're you're a different person on stage than you are in real life or do you put no. any thought into that at all like being a character no, I, I'm, no I don't I mean um, I'm going to say something to you now it's really not self deprecatory I guess in a way it is. I don't think <laughs> okay. of myself as a smart person you know I, 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 let, me, let me try to calm that down um, okay <laughs> I'm a gut guy okay I know what you mean yeah. a, a lot of my stuff isn't pre- thought through man it's just like that's i just uh, make my decisions at the moment yes and i don't remember things much i mean like guys come up to me when i'm in europe or whatever reminding me what records i was on i mean like i'm on two of maynard ferguson's most famous records i even remember it you know what i mean right. I mean, i'm a freddie hubbard i mean i'm uh when when boulez you, uh, you, all right, so now that I put myself down, let me put myself <laughs> Build it back up. up. Build it back up. Here we go. Right. Yeah. Boulez and I had, uh, you know, I played Boulez's ensemble downtown. He had like a small ensemble down at uh, Cooper Union okay. uh, by yeah. the college down there. And then when they needed a sub for my teacher, Boulez was totally open for me to come up there, you know, that kind of thing. But I didn't want to audition for the orchestra when my teacher uh, retired. I just, I was already busy in other things. And, um, so I didn't show up, but even though I didn't, Boulez hired me to play the middle solo in Amérique by oh. Edgar Varese. And yeah. Boulez, that was one of Boulez's, that was one of the first recordings of Amérique. I think he subsequently recorded in Chicago 10 or 20 years later. But that was a big compliment to me that even though I turned him down mm -hmm. um, and he already hired somebody else, he still hired me to do the solo. So, you know, so I'm not... It, you well, know, I mean, man. what I I wrote down. Bill like, Evans was at the Carnegie Recital Hall concert. He hired me for his band. Wow. Oh, I think I think that you you just summed up for me that being humble says something. You know, I mean, like. Oh yeah. You were you from were humble in front of these people, you know, and and that yeah. they took notice, and it was like 
okay, we can trust this guy, you know. That... Yeah, but guys would come up to me and say, hey, uh, you think you can do this and so-and-so and do a good job on this? Mm-hmm. I would say to them, honestly, I, I don't know. I'm going to try my, <laughs> I'm gonna try my best, yeah. man. Uh-huh. I, I don't know. Yeah, right. maybe. Yeah, you know. And uh, more often than not, they trusted me because I they knew I was a practicer. Mm-hmm. Um, they knew I was always on time. Man, I can't tell you. That's 80%. You know, there's an 80% rule. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's a real philosophy about it. If something is 80%, it's right. So, I don't know, some kind of weird thing. Mm. But showing up on time is 80% of the gig. And right. then show up on time, be prepared. And then be ready to adapt. Yep. You know, don't get locked into, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's been the most consistent thing about my career. I'm most, I'm, I'm prepared, man. Okay. And, and, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll veer. And I'll yeah. always be there on time, even okay. when I'm hungover. <laughs> nice. That, that yeah. hasn't happened since I was 46. That's like 30 <laughs> years ago, man. But, but I, I used to like to party. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, we all like to party. <laughs> Trombone yeah. players like to party, yeah, right? we like to mind. party, man. You know. So. Yes. But I, yeah, so... Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about, man. No, it's okay. I mean, this is the point. We're supposed to get off on, right, <laughs> on, just, on I, everything. I, I just hope I'll, I don't get fired from everything. Man. I'll focus back on something, all right? All so right, we, man. we, uh, we talked a lot about literature in the past few days together. And mm. um, I, I'm just wondering how you correlate or relate literature to your music, your performance. I mean, does that, the narrative aspect of it is, is obviously a thing that we can think about to inform our music and stuff like that. But um, I'm just wondering how you think about. Well, you stay alive. Stay alive. Um, I played in the brass quintet. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Juilliard, we, the fourth or fifth, I was there for six years. So I think it was the fifth and sixth year we started, or fourth, fifth, fifth and sixth year we started, and then we continued for a couple of years after. And when the American, when the Canadian brass, uh, Ronnie Rahm, a trumpet player, a guy named Bob Cernak, the Metropolitan Opera manager, David Jolly, yeah, mm-hmm. great French horn player, and a fellow who just passed away, Garrett List, who went to teach in uh, Liege, Belgium. Uh, uh, Jolly and Garrett List were readers. Mm. Um, I, I would, I read a little, you know, but it was always, you know, novel, trashy stuff and, you know, um, uh, but they started hipping me to, to guys like William Blake mm-hmm. and, and so on and so forth. And I took to it and the reading I was, I'm very insecure. I'm not so insecure now, but, um, that kind of went away when I was in my 50s, not went away. I get nervous before. Oh man, I'm, I've been listening to Gilbert Gottfried's uh, podcast. <laughs> Love Gilbert Gottfried. Oh yes. man, mm-hmm. and he has guys like Artie Lang on. He has all these crazy mofo's on, <laughs> but they talk about the craft. Yes, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, they talk about guys like, oh, how did this guy do that? How did that guy do that? And they all came to the conclusion they're nervous before they walk out. Mm. And that's how I am, man. I'm nervous. Uh, and then somehow when you go out, you deal. You yeah. know, like they were even talking about, I don't know if you know Don Rickles. You know, yes, you know that. of yeah. course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Don Rickles, they were even saying, man, he had to have like three drinks before he came out. Wow, I mean, and yeah. you think about that, Don Rickles. Um, so, uh, but I was even uh, more insecure than that, just in general, you know. So I started reading not novels and not... um nonfiction, but I would be reading biography and autobiography. Oh, yeah. How did these mofos get through? Yeah. And, uh, and, and so it started out with, they're, they're, they're teaching me, like uh, Henry Miller, a very famous mm-hmm. writer, now deceased. Uh, you have to deal with your personal experiences as you go. Right. He would write Which, about what his, his day-to-day kind of... He actually uh, right? did. He, yeah, he, he did. Oh, that's his, that's what his that became his style. Right. Or Allen Ginsberg, great poet. Mm-hmm. Uh, Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg did everything he was supposed to do in college. Uh, he did, did his homework, did whatever the hell he had to do. Mm-hmm. But for a goof, 
he used to doodle and write stuff in a private notebook. Just yeah. to goof. He realized it was that that became his style. Oh, yeah. Right. Nice. That became his style. Mm -hmm. And um, he made a lot of mistakes and did his thing. But that's what he did, you know, or uh, like this. Uh, I read a lot about painters and uh, how they approached uh, Van Gogh and all these cats. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do I apply it? Mm -hmm. It gives you a sense of rhythm. Okay. You know, even if you look in the back there, there's a Picasso. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, See that. Uh, why do I love that? Because there's motion. Mm -hmm. There's humor. Yes. Uh, this is about his secretary and his good friend. Uh, a lot. Of, I'm not saying there's humor in everything he does. Um, but there's motion. There's humor. There's odd symmetry, which helps you in your resolutions, helps you in your colors, mm. helps you in your statements. When you open a book and you read that first sentence, grabs you right away. Yes. That's the job. So you figure that out. Now, I learned that actually from pop music. Um, because I didn't have a record player all those years, I was just listening to A&M radio, yeah. R&B, mm -hmm. and pop. If a pop record didn't grab you in the first five, ten seconds, you weren't going to listen to it. Yeah. You know, but no matter what it was. But. Yep. So, I mean, sentences, paragraphs, run-on sentences, short sentences, that's how you phrase. Right. You know. Um, so that's great. Oh, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but no, you you know, colors, that, or you learn that Schoenberg was a painter before yeah. he was a, you know, so all of this, or in Europe, it was artists, uh, writers, artists, and musicians used to hang out. We don't do that anymore. Right, know? yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes it was the, uh, I don't know who came first, could have been the writers and then the artists and the painters and then the musicians. But uh, <laughs> The chicken or the egg, right? <laughs> well, yeah, but, yeah. No, but there, was a, there was a kind of a yeah. chronology. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. That's great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm. We don't read anymore for crying out loud. Brass players. If I mentioned yeah. to you, we were doing a bunch of who, what, who, what, mm -hmm. why, why, why do I do? Museum. I used to take my classes to the Met because I, and we would talk about these things: the color, the, the mm -hmm. Kandinsky. Kandinsky was a musician, was a painter. His his blue writer, and that yeah. whole movement was uh, was dealing with color and harmony. Sure. It's all interwoven. Uh, unfortunately, the way the conservatory is set up now, it's it's too uh, the divorced. Push, of, push of to the way. orchestra almost. <laughs> well, there is, you know. I mean, yeah. um, and but I, I'm hoping that the positive of this whole seclusionary behavior of the COVID inflicted yeah. population will make guys realize that they have to do other things. You know, yeah, it's, uh, it's oh, yeah, a bleak. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of bleak. Um, you know. I'm 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 personally. I mean, you are also optimistic about it, but I'm I'm personally optimistic that people will be craving the outing. I think so. You know, I mean, it's it's uh, a lot of. Oh, it's going to be of, wonderful. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be like a war just ended. You know, people are going to go outside and. I think hug each I, other I, and stuff. It's I think, and I think the vaccine, uh, if that happens or whatever, uh, um, whatever happens with that, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, next, mm -hmm. I think next year, yeah, this time will be different than now. Yes, you know, Definitely. but don't forget, a lot of my positive attitude is my age too. You know. Oh yeah. I mean, I could spout <laughs> all this philosophic bullshit, mm -hmm. but you really can't totally believe in everything i'm saying if you got to be doing your auditions yes okay you, you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like um there are certain i mean i'm you know when when glenn gould recorded the goldberg variations mm -hmm. it was very different when he was a young man and then when he recorded it when he was an old guy right yeah so you can't you I, you, you can't do your old guy Goldberg variations before you do the young guy. <laughs> you know what I mean, man? You can't jump yes, right. Do. You can't jump right to the end. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a believer in this thing about that. You got to do everything perfect before you move on to the next step. I'm not a right, believer right, in right. that. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Let, let's let's talk about that the the state of the music industry then because I I think I think that's that's a it's troubling I I, I don't know I, I people are like like you said conservatories you ever notice how many sixty to ninety thousand sports arenas there people sports arenas there are now around the country yes mm -hmm. a lot of those people aren't going to buy tickets to go hear Beethoven's Ninth man right yeah. Well, that, that's that's another thing, too. I mean, you talk a lot about appealing to intellectuals. I mean, what we're doing is, is uh, you know, when we research a piece of music and uh, like you said with the Schubert that you performed, I believe, mm -hmm. it's like you research it a lot and then you made a decision that was an educated decision to change it well, up. Well, actually, I made the you know? decision before I researched it. The oh. research, the research yeah. was to give me to thine own self be true. You know, that Othello, hmm. the Shakespeare thing, yeah, to yeah, thine yeah. own self be true. Uh, I mean, you know, you could BS the world, but you got to really know that you are doing that. Once yes. you forget that you're doing that, <laughs> yeah. then I don't know what, you know. Okay. So yeah. I, I I wanted to be sure I had justification uh, to take these. Uh, and I'll tell you, man, um, the dress rehearsal of that orchestra concert was nightmarish for the producer and the conductor. Oh, wow. um, I, I, I they heard me play the Schubert arpeggio on with the piano, mm -hmm. uh, and they heard me playing it really pretty straight ahead. But but two years later, by the time I got the orchestra uh, orchestra arrangement done, I was already in a different space with my interpretation. Right. And at yeah. the dress rehearsal, we only had you know, when you're playing freelance orchestras, man, bang bang bang. Mm -hmm. You know, so we didn't have that many rehearsals. We had maybe one rehearsal, and then the dress rehearsal was in. At the dress rehearsal, they couldn't follow me. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, uh, and and the producer came back with the conductor, both friends of mine, both brilliant intellects, mm -hmm. supporters of mine. And the producer said, hey, Dave, you know how much money we have invested in this concert? You know, because I wasn't the only thing on a concert. You know? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You replaced the money we got invested? Just reel it in, man, you know? <laughs> and, and then he split. And the conductor, Angel Gilo Donas, a Spanish cat, mm -hmm. he said, Davey, no, you go for it. And nice. we went out. You talk about risk taking, man. I mean, these cats, there's a whole blog. I ought to send it to you. There was a whole blog written about that. Yeah, please do. Describing the story mm -hmm. and then realizing that the producer wrote the article and he said he realized five minutes into the concert, this was going to be a major success. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He realized it yep. then. And so, but I did a lot of failing, man. You know, I mean, I yep. did a lot of failing. You know? I think it's, I think it's necessary, you know? I mean, so I'm wondering too, um, you're talking a lot about your, the, all this, wide variety of gigs that you've done you know i'm i'm wondering with the with the uh the added resource of the internet um and what that's done to the music industry do you see you know your motto is to like um if you stay in the building you'll stay in the building right right those who stay in the building will stay in the building yes so right. i think i think that now you can stay in the building but be everywhere right so i i'm no. you don't think so i i, I would love to hear your thoughts on this because a lot of people are forging a career on the internet oh, you know they, so, they are indeed but a yeah. lot of people aren't a lot of people aren't yes yeah That's i mean uh, I, I don't again um although i love the internet and i love youtube you know i, I what do you call that i surf is that what they call that when you go from search what you, surf? Yeah, what, surf what do they call that when you go from <laughs> one thing to another you know um well one youtube thing oh yeah you, you go down like the chain of the yeah yeah yeah, yeah right i don't yeah, know so what yeah yeah i okay. don't know what that's called yeah we used to call you go it down surfing. the rabbit hole of the yeah right yes. you know mm -hmm. uh i love that i mean i'm hearing just getting lost in youtube stuff. right oh i'm hearing yeah. some awesome 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 stuff yes but you got to get out in the street and i mean so what i mean uh right i i think i mentioned this to you or i mentioned it to your class um, I like to say to my students, um, I want you to go out to hear concerts all over New York. The only places you can't go are Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and I tell them, I don't want you to hear old men playing the same stuff all the time, man. Go out where there are guys five years older than you, mm -hmm. 10 years older than you. Bring your horn. You never know. 
Right. Listen to what those guys are doing to try to make to try to make it where those guys are going to to expand the music. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. What do, what do you foresee that being? I mean, when you go out on the street and you go to a concert and you said, bring your horn. Well, I mean, when you call a concert, I mean, I'm not yeah. talking about a 2000 seat venue. Right. Right. Of course. I'm not, talking yeah, about yeah. I mean, like I basement. can't tell you how many <laughs> I'm playing. A, I'm playing a concert. Then I'm practicing my ass off for 25 people this weekend. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played a concert at Lincoln Central Library when I was just starting out. In my, well, I was in my 40s. Just like my mother and father went to it, and uh, there were maybe four or five people in the whole library who went to the show. Right. My, my, my pops come back. God bless his soul. Comes back. He says, "Damn, I hate to see you work so hard for." Uh, nobody's showing up you know but that's <laughs> yeah. what i do yes and i'm not out there for them i'm out there for me man i'm mm -hmm. learning i'm I'm learning i'm groovulating on the music mm. um you know i always wanted to write i even wrote some kind of a one piece of julia but i was always so insecure um uh, when i was 65 a guy named lutz roth rath mm -hmm. cello player ran a festival called uh, the washington square chamber orchestra they were doing a Stravinsky piece for 19 wins in piano, concerto, piano concerto for 19 wins. In piano. He comes up to me, man, out of nowhere. He says, hey, Dave, you want to write for the concert? I mean, he wow. heard me play. He heard me do Schubert, so he knew that I was kind of expansive in my approach, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, you don't have to write for 19 people. I said, no, man, I'm going to write for 19 people. Mm -hmm. And... For about six months, I just did it. I devoted myself to it. I mean, again, I was making money from other areas. That's right. the wonderful thing about, you know, European careers and American careers are different. Sure. Um, to make a career in Europe where you have support from more different agencies, mm -hmm. perhaps you could be more tunnel vision. Oh, but okay. yeah. in the U.S. of A., which I love dearly, that's a whole different set of financial barriers and career right. and, and openings and stuff like that. So a lot of the stuff that I did just enabled me to make shifts. You know, I was kind of a busy studio guy. I mean, uh, yeah, for about 25 years, I managed everything. And I gave up a lot of the freelance orchestras because I was missing rehearsals and stuff to do the studio work because it was so lucrative. Right. And I put that music the money back into music mm -hmm. and I use that to do my projects and support my family. Right. And um, a few of the orchestras kept me on because they knew what I was doing, mm -hmm. but I was very savvy to both the, I like to say street handbook and the ivory tower handbook. Right. Um, you know, when I say street, um, when you go out and play in front of the real concert going public, or people your age or more mature than you, you learn very quickly what can be done, what what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Yes. You learn real quick mm -hmm. and real boom. Yeah. You That's put it in front of the buyer, right? <laughs> put it in yeah. front of the buyer. Look at the part, I mean, there's a French word for the audience interaction between the audience and the and the performer. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the aspects of being a painter is to sell you stuff. Yes. Right. Make a living at what you're doing. I mean, a lot of painters, of course, we know that whole story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and writers, too. You know, Bill of Bartok. You know, yeah, couldn't couldn't get arrested, you know, couldn't make a living, couldn't, you know, but he finally did. Or Charles Ives, nobody even listened to his music. Well, he was Courier and Ives. Did you know that? You know what Courier and Ives is? No. Courier and Ives is the most one of the most famous insurance companies, and that's oh. Charles Ives. Really? Charles Ives was an insurance mogul, and he what? would come home. <laughs> yes, rich man. Wow, interesting. Uh, he was an insurance mogul, and he'd come home and he'd write all his music, and it was up in his attic. Yeah, wow. He really played his stuff. It was whack. Huh. I was very lucky with the Sikorsky Orchestra. I premiered two of his orchestra pieces. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Wow. Very lucky. Premiered some Luciano Berio orchestra pieces. Uh, very lucky. Uh, Leopold Sikorsky, when he was in his 90s, was conducting that stuff. Fantastic. Wow. One of the one of the Ives uh, symphonies had three conductors. One of them is still alive. Oh, Jose yeah. Cerebri. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, man. I'm... I'm, I'm 
vibes. I know what you're talking so about. So they gave Ives a Pulitzer Prize. Right. When, when Ives was like, I don't know how old, maybe just be, be, 10 years before he died or something like that. You know what he said? Mr. Ives, we'll give you the Pulitzer Prize. And blah, blah, blah. He said, awards are for Boy Scouts. <laughs> that, that was Ives. He was a rich wow. man and he just wrote. Yeah, wrote, 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 wrote. He did. Wow, very prolific, definitely. Yeah, man. Why? Why did we talk about that? I don't remember. I'm gonna go on to something else now. Yeah, go on. To <laughs> so, so you you talk you talk. Man, about... I'm talking a lot. No, I, I love I, it. I, 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 all right, man. I mean, uh, this is what people want to hear. I mean, they right, want to hear you right. talk. That's the whole all point, right, man. Okay. I mean, I can say some stuff, but they don't want to hear that. So it's all right. Well, they will one day. <laughs> Maybe. No, especially if you keep this going. Yeah, I think I think this this is gonna be interesting. I'm yeah, just, start just expanding your, it. Yeah, getting different types of people on. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be great. I I, so, you said something that I resonated with, and uh, I don't remember when you said it. Maybe in a in a coaching, but you said if you want to be a genius, learn how to think nothing. Right. And um, so, so to to expand on that, I I just. I've I've been learning a lot about meditation and certain focusing, centering, mindfulness sort of do you, ideas. Do, do, do you know? Um, did you ever hear the trumpet player Lou Soloff? No. Mm -mm. Lou Soloff was a great, great, great trumpet player, a great jazz player. He was in the rock and roll group Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, oh, okay. Very famous. I mean, very so very famous. And he yes. and I were buddies. And uh, we went to, a, he, he was into transcendental meditation for a while. Okay. And uh, he took me to a transcendental meditation convention. Oh, there were about four or 500 oh, people there. Right. And yeah. so <laughs> Lou and I always had a good time together. We're sitting right in the middle of this four or 500 convention, Midtown Manhattan. Okay. And for some reason, we started laughing our asses off. <laughs> and, and, and the gentleman speaking kindly said, "Sirs, would you please leave?" And that was my <laughs> that was my experience with transcendental meditation. Uh, the reason I mentioned that uh, being able to think nothing, yeah. there's no predisposition. Okay. Yeah. You know, you, you, you walk into your practice room. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a certain amount of overall time. Yep. Don't micromanage. Okay. Do your warm up. Do your blah blah. Right. And then just let your mind go free. Okay. Now, and and it's interesting because in in, in Paris in the 1920s, uh, Gertrude Stein, a very famous um, writer at that time, used to have soirees in her house. Or she brought Stravinsky in there, Ravel in there, uh, Sati, you know, the painters, or uh, Picasso was there, and all those mm -hmm. cats, um, Jacques uh, Cocteau. Okay. Yeah, lots of who I'm a very heavy fan names, of. Yeah. Cocteau, man, Cocteau. Yeah. Well, Cocteau and um, Picasso and Stravinsky, they did that uh, ballet, the Parade or something. I forget the name of the ballet, but uh, right I'm there. not sure. But well, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, Gertrude Stein and 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 both both she and Stravinsky agreed that uh, if you want to be a genius, you got to have uh, you think about nothing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I'm I'm I do meditation daily. I think, yeah, I, I sit and I, you know, focus on my breath and, um, I don't, I don't, transcendental meditation is another animal. I don't even know what the hell it is, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think it's, you're kind of, there's different types, there's, I've learned about a few different types, so there's a type where you kind of sit and you just become aware of everything else around you, and... Is that where you listen to that? I think that's <laughs> transcendental. <laughs> okay. You listen to those nice soft sounds. Yeah, I mean, no, I think I think it's important to be in silence, honestly, when you're doing this, because um, how do you practice in the morning? How do I practice? Yeah, like trombone. Yeah, like trombone. Um, I have a routine that I go through. Fast every... or slow? Very slow. Mine too. That's my meditation. I'm just thinking yes. about breathing. Right, Literally yeah. thinking about breathing and articulation. I mean, thinking about breathing from mm -hmm. the moment I. But, so I mean, I, maybe that's my. Maybe that's your meditation. But go ahead. So, so what does I, the meditation do for you? Because my brother just talked to me about that. Yeah. Shrink recommends. Uh, hey, my kid brother. He's seventy-two. <laughs> recommended meditate. So, <laughs> I mean, so all right. So. So I so, said to him, I said, yeah, how the hell do you do that? What do you think about it? What goes on? <laughs> you know, so, you know, you sit there and you listen. And, uh, yeah, so so I think the the um the idea is that you have a constant chatter in your mind, right? Like you're always kind of talking to yourself 
and you always have that voice like when you're walking down the street you know, you're kind of thinking about where you're going or where you're coming from. Some Something that's not right now, you know, like living in the moment is if you're walking down the street, oh, there's a there's a metal pole right there. The, the light's green right now. That's in the moment, you know, but a lot of people walk around very much up here, very much in the... Uh, the is path. it a neurotic thing or is it, can that be not neurotic? So, well, uh, I think that it can be focused. I okay. think that... that um, neurotic i think that people who you know you you walk by them and they're kind of talking to themselves mumbling to them that's kind of a neuroses you know that's yeah, like I, I, you know it's hard to tell those people now they could be on a telephone yeah right well that's and true they got the some yeah, nut cases coming down that's the street true. and i'm looking to see looking for his earbuds <laughs> before i run the other way all right but go ahead <laughs> so basically um the more uh humans are habit building animals like we right. you do something over and over again you build a habit and it starts to become more automatic right so you're trying to program your brain to be able to focus on only one thing at a time and in doing that like practicing like if you're you're saying your meditation well, is i'm so lucky nothing gets in the way of my thought process when i'm playing that horn that horn well, yeah, i mean that's that's exactly what i envy about about you because there i mean do you do you get distracted by text messages or youtube or something like that well, like, I mean, it depends but you know I, I don't man when i'm on that horn you know it's funny what you're saying to me man is like you know the, the great uh, buddhist the uh, guru uh, buddhist guys gurus i don't know yeah. great mm -hmm. great buddhist thinker and he's mm -hmm. telling his students i'm going to go into the woods for the winter right okay that yeah. comes out of the woods when the winter's over and the students, you know, they know he's been meditating out there, whatever the hell he's doing out there for, for two months in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And they said, they said, Guru, uh, what was it like? And he says, cold. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's the question to me. I mean, yeah, man, if I'm waiting for a business thing, mm -hmm. I, I can go right back to the, I could turn it on. At this point now, I could turn it on, turn it off. Yeah. Uh, when I start, when I was 24, and that's why I think I lost a lot of my jobs when I was 24. I shifted my whole concentration on what I wanted to do on the horn. Right. That combined with either arrogance or whatever else, every literally everybody fired me, man. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> it took me a few months, but then after I learned the process, I'd walk into a practice room, and within a minute I was off the ground. Yeah. 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 Find a routine. Yes. That can be, you know, because I just love blowing through a tube. I love yeah. blowing through a brass pipe, man. I like it too. Yep. I always make sure my horns are fun to play. Mm. Mm -hmm. The resistance of the instrument. I mean, the sound, okay, whatever comes out, that's what comes out. You find the resistance of the instrument is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And then I just love the whole thing vibrating. There was yeah. a period of time I was practicing scales literally between around six hours a day. Wow. And I couldn't tell if I was trying to escape from my young son when my wife was working <laughs> or what, you know what I mean? But I was in there practicing scales and very slow. I mean, diet, this play the scales, but like, and your mind was there the whole time, like you know, the whole, the whole the fucking whole time. time. That's meditating. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking right. about. Right. Yeah. And it got to a point after playing that routine. That routine took me two hours. Yes. I heard the sound all around me. Whoa. Yeah. Right. The right. See, because I don't think in terms of volumes, I think of moving air in a room. Yes. And so the sound was all around me, and my head was open. You know, I don't think it's a solid bone mass. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how how does your head grow when you're young? It's like an antenna, right? <laughs> there's there's something going on. Yeah. So you know, well, like I idolize guys like Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, uh, I, you know, if you know who he was, uh, great boxer. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, he used to hit you as hard moving backwards as he did forwards. Or wow. I love the samurai who could do that. Mm -hmm. And yes. I kind of identify with the samurai concept of 360 degree sound. You know, right. So, yeah. Uh, is that metaphysical? I don't know. Is that meditation? 
I don't know. I, I, I just know that I go to the gigs prepared and I love practicing all day still. Wow. So mm -hmm. stupid, maybe. I, I don't think it's stupid. I mean, I mean, I, I could be investing in the stock market all day, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's to each his own, right? I mean, you, what you like this thing, you know, like you enjoy it. it. So man, it's, it, that's it. Yeah. go with it. I mean, hey, I love it. And I'll tell you the truth, man. I, that That's the only thing I really want to teach all you mofos. <laughs> love it. I just love it. And do what you got to do to keep it going. Uh, I, I think I mentioned it to your guys, uh, Luciano Berrio, mm -hmm. Sequenza guy. Mm -hmm. He taught at Juilliard, and I was in his class. I, I just lucked out where I went. I'm telling you, man, I, for somehow I made lucky choices. Like That's my amazing, theory yeah. teacher, when I finally got into theory, was with a guy named Hall Overton, who happened to be a great classical writer, but who yeah. also did all the Thelonious Monk Big man arrangements. What? I mean, I was like, so I just lucked into hanging with him. Wow. And then man. I lucked into Berrio. Um, and Berrio would, would talk about uh, all the composers of his time and, and all the bickering and this and that, different philosophical output. And he would describe all the different things and blah, blah, blah. But I don't remember any of that. I just remember the glee that Berrio had when he was talking. This. Mm -hmm. This son of a bitch was, he loved it. Yes. Man, and I got to tell you, when all is said and done, I just love it. I just love playing the trombone in any situation, as long as the guys are good. Mm -hmm. I don't have a favorite uh, genre, orchestra, jazz, big band, yep. classical, as long chamber as you got music, the trombone and, in your hand, right? That's... Man, as long as the cats are good. And I've been playing mm -hmm. like cats like Itzhak Perlman, you know, you're my, all these cats, yeah. Winton, Wait, Wait, all these guys. I mean, uh, Gil Evans, that Jones. Uh, Duke, I, Do they all have that same sort of mentality, like the love I think, of it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to be a master, like these cats are masters, you you, you, you got to love it, man. I mean, yes. uh, it's not about going to work. <laughs> no, these cats were... Man, I, I played a concert at Charles Ives' house on um, in Connecticut. That's where Charles... Uh, Charles Ives' house on a July 4th weekend with Aaron Copeland conducting. Oh, wow. You dig? Um, <laughs> and these were just things I did. And I yeah. kind of, just, you know, uh, um, you have to put yourself out there. Yeah. And you can't do that by sitting in the school. Right. You just can't do it. You talk about YouTube? I don't know. <laughs> Is uh, Gergiev, or, uh, he's out there in the street. Yeah, your stuff is on YouTube, man. Gergiev, man, I go to hear that cat. Whenever yeah. he's in town, man, I go to hear that cat. He plays uh, Tchaikovsky and um, all those Russian cats, Shostakovich. Mm -hmm. You know, w w when he plays Tchaikovsky, you could hear that Shostakovich came out. Mm, yeah. When American cats sometimes do Tchaikovsky, it's that... You know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Yes, you hear that with Gergiev, but you hear it. Yes. Man, I love Gergiev. I went to a concert once uh, that he was conducting, and they did all the war horses, man. They did um, Alexander Nevsky, and then they did all this other stuff. By the last piece <laughs> of the show, the trumpet players couldn't play, man. <laughs> but it didn't matter, man, because it was so hot. You know what I mean? Yeah. The cats were cracking and whacking. And, um, yeah. Oh, but it was wild, man. It was so good. Um, we're so locked into the perfection. Right. Every note thing, man. We, we got to try to figure out a way out of that, man. Hopefully the COVID will help us out of that. Maybe all you guys will have so many jobs, you don't have time to, like, uh, wipe your, take the gravy off your tuxes, man. You, know? <laughs> uh, you go to the gig, you got that little ketchup on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got, we got tied to go now. We could take it off. <laughs> <laughs> right. I still don't know how to use that stuff. I mean, I, it, you know, but you know what I'm saying, man? You guys got to spill some gravy on your tuxedo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise it ain't worth it, man. That's right. I, I, and I think, 
that's why I had, I was lucky playing in a lot of, you know, a lot of the guys, a lot of the guys like in, in, in Juilliard when I was there and just after Juilliard and the freelance thing, they had a hard time dealing with my um, zany playing, I guess. Yeah. I don't know what to call it. Okay. But the leaders loved it. Oh. Leaders loved it because you were giving excitement to the thing. Yeah. And you jump in your Volkswagen, man. <laughs> that was my favorite car. I had a lot of cars, man, but that was my favorite. The Volkswagen Beetle, 67, Royal Blue. Cost me under 1700 bucks. Wow. 19, oh, yeah, man. Oh, my God. And that thing, I remember my, my wife and I, man, I did it. Christmas Eve gig, we'll never forget this, man. It was snowy and all. I was going to get to the church. It was for the midnight mass. And it's snowing as about when we turned corners, man. That car wouldn't skid. It just like got up and shifted. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. Volkswagen Beetles, man. God damn. <laughs> Oh man. Anyway, then I don't well, know. well, what I'll ask one more question and then I'll do the rapid fire things, but All right. I think um I'm not good at rapid fire, man. But go ahead. Man. No, go it's ahead. okay. It's okay. All right. All right. They're they're silly questions anyway, so. Oh, okay. okay. So so you play with a lot of amazing people and yeah. um I have. I'm so lucky, man. Yeah, you're very lucky. I, 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 I am. <laughs> no, it's good, but you love what you do and it's amazing. I I just wonder is in the moment of concert, like playing a concert, um, if it goes really well, if it's going really well, is there like a something tangible there? You know, like some some. You know, I had another body. I hate I hate the the bass trombone kind of solo in Beethoven Nine. Yeah, hanging around E flats and stuff, and that scares the shit out of me. That solo. Yeah. But there was one concert that I was playing. It was a small orchestra with chorus at Carnegie Hall. Gerard Schwartz was conducting. It might have been the New York Chamber Orchestra. I was a member of that. Okay. I had an out-of-body experience. I never had wow. that before, man. I got to the solo, and I'm playing. And I see myself while I'm playing. I'm envisioning myself. I mean, I'm sorry for being so metaphysical again. No, it was going start. so well that I was watching myself play this wow. solo, man. Yeah, yeah. And then there was another experience, man. I got called to play with the Boston Symphony. A guy named Douglas Joe got sick. Yes. <laughs> and they called me up, and I was I hadn't played the horn in like five days, which is unusual for me. But I went down to my nephew's wedding in Sarasota, Florida, mm -hmm. and I was drinking and this and that. And the manager from the uh, uh, Boston Symphony calls me up and says, hey, look, Dave, uh, we're going to need you to come down to Carnegie Hall, and um, we don't have time for rehearsal. You're going to have to sit down, sight read uh, Beethoven 9 and the Schoenberg uh, Chamber Concerto. And, and I said, come on, Lou, stop the crap. You know what I mean? I thought my friend, and I, and I, and I some other cursy kind of things and yeah. dirty things. Come on, yep. And then he's laughing. And, and he says, no, no, I'm, I'm serious. And he said, if you don't believe me, call Ron Barron. So I call, you know who Ron Barron was? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I call yeah. Ron Barron. I say, hey, Ron, man, I'm at this wedding. I've been juicing for a few days. I uh, uh, haven't touched the horn. Uh, he wants me. You know what Ron said to me? What do you say? You want the gig or not, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so I flew home, left my family there, flew home, warmed up, went to Carnegie Hall and played Beethoven 9. Now, what's his name? Who who was the guy that retired from the, it was Ron Barron, Norman Bolter. Norman Bolter, yes. Norman Bolter is sitting next to me, mm -hmm. right? We're playing Beethoven 9 and I'm having a good time because there's another part of Beethoven 9 where just the trombone is, I forget where it is, just the bass trombone is playing with the strings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to play it like it's disco time, you know? Yeah. And Norm starts to wave me out. No, 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 no. And then he realized I was in the right place. Oh, yeah. He never heard it like that. Oh. What was your question? It was yeah, just, never just, heard it like that. That's yeah, the yeah, way yeah. to go, man. Never heard it like that. Yes. And if the conductor wants you to back off, he'll say back off. <laughs> That's but nice. give him the chance to say it. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, Boulez, man, we were playing concerto for orchestra, the Bartok piece. Mm -hmm. And Boulez knew me from downtown. And he knew my crazy sense of humor, isn't that? 
uh, he's playing he ears. That guy had ears, man. We're playing the bar, and I'm playing some note half step away. It could have been an E and E flat. And he said, Mr. Taylor, that's an E flat. I said, no, maestro, I'm playing it. I denied it, you know. No, yeah. maestro. I said. And then by the end of the rehearsal, I did the same damn thing. <laughs> so we're packing up, but we're coming down. I bump into Boulez, mm. and Boulez, uh, so uh, Mr. Taylor, did you? And, and I, we just looked at each other <laughs> and laughed our asses off. You know, he was a good guy. Yes, he sounds he, like he was you. a good guy. And um, yeah. he, we were once playing. I, I actually once had a. I said something I shouldn't have said to him. You know, uh, uh, there was a modern concert where a woman, a composer friend of mine, dear mentor of mine, Lucia Lukachevsky, we were playing one of her pieces, and I see Boulez off to the side laughing. Now, I don't know if it was a laugh that he was so enchanted with the music or he was being sardonic, but I took it to the negative and I walked up and I said, hey, man, you shouldn't, come on, man, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> yeah. And he was cool. Nice, yeah. Totally cool. Last time I saw him, I was invited to a Vienna Philharmonic closed rehearsal, only about five, ten people there some of the patrons, they were playing the uh, piano concerto, the Schoenberg piano concerto. Berenbaum was the piano player. Belez wow. was the conductor. Wow. The orchestra hadn't seen the piece. First time through the piece, it didn't sound good. Second time, it did sound good. Mm -hmm. But the thing that the kappa for me was every time Berenbaum would play a phrase or this and that, he would say, a maestro talk. He deferred to Belez. Maestro, is this how you think I should be doing? Yeah, wow. That's a lesson. Right there, that's a lesson, man. Baron you know, Boy you see those yeah. cats. Amazing. You see those cats working like that, man. You know, man. Mm -hmm. you know you're in good company at that point. Well, no, that's a good company, man. It's like okay, it's cool. Yes, that's the bottom cool. line. Okay, yes. it's cool. Yes, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what's your rapid fire? All right, let's do it. <laughs> so I'm just gonna ask questions. They have it's it begs a short response. So. You, I'm sure you won't right, have man. any problem with that. All right. First one, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. No? Well, it depends on the company. I mean, if uh, the yuppies, yeah. I'll take it as a no, all right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of a no with pineapple on pizza. Yeah. Okay. No worries, yeah. no worries. No, but I like broccoli on pizza. I like all of that. Yeah. Pineapple on pizza. My mother used to have, uh, used to play mahjong with the ladies, man. And they used to put little maraschino cherries and toothpicks on pineapple. So I, I like pineapple, but uh, <laughs> on pizza. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. All right. Yeah. Here's a next one. Weirdest thing you've seen in someone else's house. <laughs> Abstain. Abstain. <laughs> Epstein. Um, <laughs> I don't oh, no. know. I'll, I'll tell you why Epstein. Okay. I don't think in those terms. I mean, I don't. I don't think in those. Terms. So you're not. Okay. So you're not. You're not judgmental enough to. to no. No, okay. I don't think in those terms, man. I All mean, right. uh, smells. Yeah. You yeah. Know. So it smells like shit. You know. <laughs> weird things. No, I don't. What's the weirdest those... thing you have in your house? Oh, I don't know, man. Um, look around my room. Uh, <laughs> I have a, I have an empty uh, Armagnac bottle from 1946. Oh, wow. It was the last bottle I had uh, with my father. Uh, I got about a hundred mouthpieces. I have, I have enough horn paraphernalia and slides that um, I'm a very conservative man. I mean, I. Uh, uh, my, every time Christian Griego comes over the house, she begs him to take some of the stuff out, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I guess that would be boxing gloves I got hanging in the back. Uh, that's not I weird. Like that's just, I like boxing. That's uh, not, my yeah, father yeah. and I used to watch the Gillette Blue Blade uh, Friday Night Fights. I'm, I'm, uh, I like that. Go ahead. Keep it. I'm sorry. I'm not a good no. I'm not a good guy with that. All right. Go ahead. No, don't worry. It's fine. All right, this I'm is not gold. worried. I'm just trying this to tell gold. you. That's all. all right. <laughs> I'm I'm. Also not judgmental, so this is perfect. All right, yeah, right. <laughs> Favorite author, and I know this might be hard, but oh, just give it's... give us something to read. You know, well, you know, it's interesting, man. Uh, since this COVID began, I found this Pulitzer Prize guy named Richard Powers. Richard Powers. I didn't read his Pulitzer Prize book um, because when I, as soon as I see here Pulitzer Prize book, I can't read it. You know what I mean? So I read a bunch of his. I read a book of his and got so enamored with him that I kept on reading books. And I finally read his Pulitzer Prize book. 
and it was pretty sm slamming, you know. So, I mean, I, to tell you a favorite author, that's I read this guy. I must have read eight of his books over the last couple of months. I mean, I just, oh, yeah. yeah, he's pretty good. Okay. I, I recommended him to John Zorn, you know, the f famous uh, composer. But he said, no, I don't read novels anymore. And I said, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this this one was a... Uh... My friends wanted me to ask this, so you can oh, you can ab you can abstain from this one as well if you want. But but <laughs> well, I didn't really abstain from the weird thing. No, you didn't. It's just I don't think uh, well, people are weird, man. People are weird, period, man. You yes, know, I mean, you know. that's true. Go ahead. All right, so here this is pushing the envelope a little bit. All right. Oh boy. <laughs> Indica or sativa? Say that again. Indica or sativa? The hell is that? Oh, okay. So you don't know. So then, are you talking about smoke? Yes. Oh man, no. I'm a, I'm into harder stuff than that. I, smoke <laughs> makes you paranoid. I, I don't know, man. I'm, not now. I'm clean. Since I'm, I'm 46, but but smoke <laughs> it's so uh, smoky. You know. I, don't know. I, I I was, you know, I you know I you know I hung out with cats like Rolling Stone kind of cats, man. You know what I mean, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm, Smoke, okay. <laughs> I mean, I hate to disappoint you. No, but I, no, I'm but not I mean, for 30 years, here's the problem with that stuff I never let anything get in the way of my career. Yes, so whatever I did, I did, and I drank a lot too, never anywhere near a gig, you yes. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, uh I was practicing so much when I was young that I used to have to have a hangover or whatever, just so I had to take a day off from practicing. <laughs> I had to force myself. You'd I set yourself say, up. For I don't a recommend day off. that. I don't recommend that. You yeah. have to know that. I don't recommend any, okay. whatever the hell those names were you mentioned. Okay. Uh, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend drinking. I don't recommend doing any kind of, um, social uh, recreational things like that i think they're terrible absolutely terrible <laughs> and you can quote me <laughs> they might quote what you said earlier <laughs> <laughs> well yeah indica and sativa are just different types of marijuana you know like dude indica makes you more mellow sativa makes you more up there you know That's dude <laughs> Stay away from those entry level things. <laughs> Again, I do not recommend this stuff. Right. I think it's awful. Yes. And the scourge of civilization. Scourge, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm you can you. quote me on that. I will, right will, will Samuel will George, quote me. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question. Uh oh, here we go. go ahead. What instrument gets the most girls? We had a little conversation about that. We did. I would have to go between those sons of bitches, trumpets or drums. Trumpets or drums. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I would have to go with the, <laughs> you know, all my friends are trumpet players. I never really, I mean, Jim Pugh was just about the only friend I had on, trump, on trombone, but all my friends were trumpet players because those cats, they knew how to party more than trombone players back then. I don't know what trombone players are like now, man, but <laughs> trumpet players, man, who trumpet guess. players, man. They, mm. I, I, I think, um, man, I would have, but what do you think, man? Ah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think you have something with the drummers. I think yeah, the drum the thing, man. That's the same that's shape, you know. They're always banging. That's on tribal them. shit, man. Boom, yeah, boom, yeah. boom, 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 <laughs> boom. You know, they like that. You know, I wouldn't know, man. You know, I'm married for like uh, fifty. It'll be fifty-three years this March. Wow, congratulations! Yeah, we're married for a long time, yeah, and yeah, yeah. um, and I think the thing that so I don't really know too much about, but I I have eyes. You know what I mean? I see what goes on. Yes. Um. I would have to say, if you want a long marriage, there's something very vital. Compatible fantasy shifts. Compatible. Remember that. Compatible fantasy shifts. Okay. That's the important ingredient in a long marriage. Compatible fantasy shifts. CFS. Can, what, what does that mean? Break it down. Well, I mean, we all change during the course of our lives. 
Yes. And it's lucky if you can be open-minded enough or lucky enough mm, yeah. to be able to shift. That's anywhere from food tastes, uh, right. whatever taste you want to say, you know what I mean? Yes. So, compatible with fantasy shifts. I think that's, I, I didn't envy the guys that went from girlfriend to girlfriend. It's too much it gets in the way of practicing. Man. I yes. don't know, man. Unless you don't have anything else, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, man. I, I I love my old lady so much. She's beautiful. Love being around her. Right. I don't, you know. I'm so happy like, for you, really. Thanks, That's man. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. Uh, of course. Yeah, it's like uh, it's kind of a groove. I, I wish that these things, uh, if that's what you young, I don't know what the hell you guys are into these days. You guys <laughs> are so pounced upon. I mean, what freedoms do you have, man? I mean, yeah, you. I don't know. I think. Hey, talk. Go back to the women thing. The go with. <laughs> go back to the women thing, <laughs> because um, <laughs> it's a hard topic. Because you know you get busted for all of that stuff. So how do you guys deal with primal uh, stuff? I think, I think you... that there's been a big swing to the woke culture. Like we were talking about that before. Big swing that way, and I think that the real. The real reality is somewhere in the middle. Very, I'm so happy to hear that. Man. Yeah, and I think I think that uh, that it's going to take a while, but I think things will shift back kind to of to like a normal this. kind yeah. of a male female. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I'm, I'm kind of hoping, man. I'm yeah, I think hoping, man. I think that the relations have been stressed a lot. Um, just media, you know, like the the amount of. So what do you guys do in school? I mean, I mean, you ask women out. I mean, yeah, how, how does that? Yeah, I mean, I, I and nobody gets insulted, and you know, I mean, old guys like us, we're afraid of, you know. Well, I, I worry, I worry that like um, a rejection, like a, a guy coming up to a girl and asking her out, right, or something right. like that, and right. she doesn't like that. It's not just rejecting the the guy anymore. It's like. I didn't like that, so I'm gonna do something. Right, about that's it. what I'm talking about. How yeah, do you that, avoid that kind of crap? That's that's the danger of it. I think. I think that the the cancel aspect of that, like the cancel culture, is. So how does a guy ask a girl out? I don't know. You just gotta be careful. Pick your words carefully, I guess. Oh, you really do. It's a whole conscious. It's not just so, a yeah. flip. It's a whole conscious, um, which is nice, actually. I mean, that uh, we, we need it to be gentled up a little bit. Yeah, that's what I think. I think that you the know? answer is somewhere in the middle, right? Like, Yeah, we needed to. Yeah. I, I'm not necessarily... The Me Too thing, I go along with it. But, I mean, yeah. yeah, we needed to be gentled up. But that's not ruining your guys' fun? Um, I don't I don't think so. Okay, I, good. I don't think so, yeah. Good. I, I think... I think that women are more understanding than the the idea of. of you think it's looser because we're in conservatories. You think it's different in regular uh, academic, uh, normal college situations, liberal college situations. Um, I'm I'm really I'm I mean I'm I'm only experienced in a conservatory, right? But, right. So so I've yeah. I've, you know, I I practice a lot, and I've had I've had girlfriends throughout the time musicians or non-musicians yeah musicians so it's it's like i don't know I, my wife's not a musician okay she was a school elementary art uh early childhood art teacher yeah okay yeah, yeah. so I'm, i mean i don't really know what to say, what to tell you but it's it's like I, I think it's just normal i mean just there's more of an emphasis on being a nice guy be a good guy yeah just being a good guy and and don't project as being gross or yeah right you know right and don't like rape and all that stuff is well no i mean on yeah, one we're side not, of, we're not even going in that yeah, direction I, I i'm just saying there. as a normal guy right. you're sitting in a class and you see a young lady and you, mm -hmm. you want to go for a drink or something like that yeah I mean, that's still normal of course yeah yeah good yeah good. we do we know a lot of i don't want names are there a lot of assholes in school yes there are a lot of assholes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, I I don't know. I, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a problem. I think it's a problem. I think oh, the inter really internet is. is making it more of an issue. Yeah. So what do you mean? I think that, that, um, different outlets or people are exposed to different media, depending on what you like, you know, your, your Google will push this kind of stuff to you, you know? 
So it's like um, you're kind of in this hole that you can't get out of, I think. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how that relates to. No, just be a good guy. Yeah. Just be a good I guy. So. All right, I'm glad to hear that. Well, you guys are thinking about that, though, right? That's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's so it has had a positive has had a positive impact. I think so. Wonderful, wonderful. I think so. Wonderful. Uh, I know. I'm very happy um, that there's a better mix of brass players in the school now. Yes. I'm I'm very thrilled about that, and I'm honored that. Um, in your quintet, what are there, two women or three women? And then in my other quintet, there are two or three. It's wonderful, man. Yeah, it's uh, definitely wonderful, man. It's it's uh, making it a whole. You know, another thing too, man. I mean, um, the orchestras have to open up more. Right. Uh, to multicultural aspects man well i was i was gonna ask you well on the in the same vein then like the racism i read i read a couple articles we had to write an essay on it recently about racism in music and and or just like the class cultures and stuff like that and trying to break those break down those barriers and people were suggesting different ways of auditioning and things like that i mean i know i'm sure you've been around certain things that you could talk about. I, I'm no, ask me curious. a question. You have to ask me a question because that's such a wide open uh, okay. question. You know. It's so, a... um, an example of bias, inherent bias in an organization that you've been witness or witnessed. The that... lovely thing about my career, and I mention this not too often to people, is I avoid. I was able to avoid those racist situations. Yes. I didn't become a member of organizations where that I, I, I didn't play the game. You know, I've been playing in multicultural bands all my life. Right. You know, um, since I'm in my 20s, I'm, st I'm still doing that. I mean, uh, the orchestras were a little bland, shall we say. Yes. And I'm very happy now that um, there's an emphasis to open that up. Right. I very, think, yeah, the orchestras music, are getting really The music involved. will be better. The music will be better, man. Yes, I think so, too, yeah. Mm -hmm. are, the cats, are the cats thinking that? But what about the audition process? What are you, what are you thinking? Well, someone suggested that they get, get rid of the blind... I, f I don't remember who it is, but they get rid of the blind aspect just to ha be more inclusive of the people in the... Um, col people of color and things like that and it was kind of like to me it was like uh you should have the best musician in the group right the person who has the best audition right so i don't well i don't know uh, you know auditions to me man that's one day that's one what sorry that's just one day yes and then you get to the final maybe and that's another or maybe the prelims and the finals are the same day and right i think the important thing is when you sit down with the section and play you know? right. One of the nice things about my freelance career all these years um, didn't take auditions. Right, yeah. You, you, you were in the group, and if you couldn't play, you wouldn't get fired. You just wouldn't get rehired. Got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that kind of a thing. Uh, so I, I was always... I don't think I took... Like I said, I didn't want to audition for major. I took an audition for the Metropolitan Orchestra. I got into the finals. <laughs> Gould and those cats know it. I, I got into the finals. There were two guys in the finals. I'm not going to mention any names. I got a little congratulations. You're in the finals. I didn't save that. And I got another letter saying, sorry, there are no finals. And they took the student oh. of the teacher. Yeah, that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I was so busy. It was a blessing in disguise, you know. Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, so, but I so I took that audition. And I don't think I, maybe a Boston Symphony years and years ago. I I never took I don't think I never took auditions. Sure. I would have played in the Philharmonic if they asked me. Right. Yeah. Wherever they ask me to play, you know, that's another thing too. People ask me, um, how do you run your career? A certain, you know, don't forget, I'm doing this over fifty years. So a certain, um, wherever I was loved the most, that's where I went. Right. I'm not sure you guys can have that freedom now. Yeah. You know, like if the guys in the jazz groups wanted me, that's why I went there. The guys in the classical groups, you know, 
I was very lucky that I played with the Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society for 25, 20, 25 years. You know? Yeah, that's amazing. Man. That was wonderful, man. Oh, yeah. man, was that wonderful. I, I got a chance to play with so many great chamber musicians. I wasn't a steady gig at Lincoln Center Chamber Society. It's when you needed a trombone. You know, you need a bass trombone or something right. like that. That was kind of nice, man. Well, Mr. I remember, Taylor, man, I, I, I'm sorry to stop you, but... No, nah, no, go ahead, man. Whatever you gotta <laughs> I got to do. I got to cut the, the stream off and all this Well, we're stuff. about 20 minutes overtime. Yes. Do you pay overtime? I pay overtime. The check's in the mail, <laughs> Mr. Taylor. All right. Well, look, at you know what? You made it very pleasant for me, so that's why I kind of ran away. Yeah, it was fun. And and you've been very open with me. I'm, I'm glad, man. Um, and I hope we have some people listening, and I hope I had some kind of salient things to say. You know. <laughs> anyway, well, kid, well, I'll see you on December 5th. Yes. Mm -hmm. at rehearsal yes sir definitely now for now brother hey how do i get to hear this thing i it'll be up on so it's gonna be on facebook uh like it'll it'll be posted on our facebook page. i thought it was on facebook now it is on facebook now but yeah it'll be saved there forever so how do i find it so type the tone dome into spotify into youtube into itunes music into uh, every everywhere like Deezer and all these. Places. Are you going to edit this? Or should I hear it before? I mean, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm mean, talking about some no, no sensitive it's, issues it's, here, man. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I don't. I think you'll be okay. Yeah, you think, gave me the okay, the thumbs up. I think so. Yes. All right, man. From the millennial himself, I will tell you, you're okay. Oh, you're a millennial. Oh, I thought you were post millennial. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit after, but you know, I thought I would. How old are you, man? 22. 22, yeah. I'm not allowed to ask you that. It's against federal guidelines. Although Is we're it? not in school now. We're on a... Yeah, I think that's the truth, man. You know, oh, I really? ask a student his age. Interesting. All right, so I didn't ask that. You volunteered. <laughs> I am 22 years old. Thank you, man. Uh, I would never have guessed it. All right, man. Ta-ta, never as we say. Either. Yes. Ta-ta. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Taylor. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the Tone Dome. Oh, man.